Thank you guys for coming. Um, my name is Brianna. Um, I'm a nursing major here at Emporia State, and this is um, a literature review that I conducted with Mrs. Peak um, last semester over um, music therapy and its relevance in nursing. Um, so we studied kind of two components of this. We studied um, music therapy as it relates to patient care, um, and so how that um, can be beneficial to our patients, but how it can also be beneficial to nurses um, as a self-care tool. So to get started, the relevance of this topic is literature now suggests that music is beneficial um, in several capacities um, for individuals in general, not just patients, not just nurses, but just for people. Um, so it can be beneficial as a stress relieving therapy um, to promote healing, to prevent illness, to increase productivity, and increase the overall quality of life. Um, so previously, music therapy has been um, a topic that is just implemented by music therapists. But now, this is suggesting that we, as um, just members of the healthcare field, can implement this into our patients' care um, and have similar results. Um, and this is beneficial because music is an affordable intervention that we as nurses can incorporate into patient care without um, having that cost burden um, for our patients because the healthcare field is expensive enough as it is, so finding these tools that are cost effective that have these benefits um, is very lucrative to most institutions. Um, so looking at the definition of music therapy, this is from the American Music Therapy Association. The clinical and evidence-based use of music interventions to accomplish individualized goals within a therapeutic relationship by a credentialed professional who has completed an approved music therapy program. Now, that's a really long definition, but if we break it down, um, the clinical and evidence-based use of mu music interventions to, accompli to accomplish individualized goals. As nurses, our whole practice is based off of evidence, and we use evidence-based practice to constantly improve patient care and quality of care. Um, and so if we kind of break this down to the definition, we are not credentialed music professionals, but um, kind of going with the research, we may be able to still implement this in a similar way and still see similar results. So the first major benefit of music therapy is decreased stress levels. Um, a study conducted by Thraspel in 2016 suggested that children who listen to music while receiving immunization injections are much more likely to be stressed. Um, so basically in this study they had two groups of kids. They had kids who listened to music while they were receiving their shots and they had other kids who did it. And the children who did um, listen to music had higher rates of satisfaction um, and they were less stressed, had better coping skills than the children who did not. Um, so there's a couple different schools of thought for that. Um, I did not see exactly what type of music that they listened to in this study, so it could have had some result on you know, decreased heart rate, which decreases those stress levels, or it simply could have been a diversion tool. I mean, with little kids, you know, sometimes just giving them something else to focus on um, can help kind of you know, reduce the anxiety of certain things. But regardless of the mechanism, it was still showed these results. Um, additionally, post-operative patients were shown to have higher rates of satisfaction and drastically less anxiety when music is used in their care. Um, and this was done kind of through several different studies, but um, this was generally done by individualized music. So they would just listen with their headphones, you know, to their own music selections, but they um, were shown qualitatively to have lower rates of anxiety. Um, additionally, these patients, um, these post-operative patients, received less pain medication um, because they had less overall um, results of, or less complaints of pain. Um, so that pain medication is um, what it, or pain is one of the main reasons that people come into the healthcare um, field seeking treatment. So if they need less pain medication overall, um, they're having less pain, they have higher rates of satisfaction, and they can potentially need to stay in the system um, for a shorter amount of time. Um, moving to the emotional and psychosocial benefits. Um, Alzheimer's disease, I'm sure most of you are familiar with, um, but it results in memory loss and overall cognitive decline. Um, but interestingly enough, this music memory seems to be spared. So this comes out as music can trigger moments of lucidity, which is um, almost like bringing someone back to their former state. Um, for example, um, there are videos of individuals who they may not remember you know, names of family members, um, maybe no longer be able to dress themselves, do those general acts of care, but after they listen to music that maybe they heard growing up or that was you know, special to them at some point in their lives, it can have moments of lucidity that trigger back kind of the, um, the essence of who they were. Um, so kind of flashes of their personality come back. Um, 
And then patients with schizophrenia may also show improved mental states and overall improved social functioning when music therapy is used in conjunction with their standard care. So music therapy is by no means taking over any sort of pharmaceutical treatments, but it may be used in conjunction um, so that the pharmaceutical treatments may not be, um, or they may not need as much of it um, to balance their care. Um, unfortunately, with schizophrenia, some of the results were inconclusive between studies, um, so further results um, need to be done, or further studies need to be done to show if it is beneficial specifically for patients with schizophrenia. Um, for the physical effects, a study conducted on 39 healthy adults um, showed their cortisol levels um, before and after art making. Um, so the art making and the music um, were tied together. There were different kinds of art. Um, in this study. So the results show dramatically lower cortisol levels after that they completed this activity. Um, and to further explain um, this study here, um, they had a couple different groups. Some you know, were doing music making, some did the art making as far as like the physical art, the painting and such. Um, but overall the results still showed those lower cortisol levels, which is like the stress hormone. Um, and another very similar study was done with preschool students um, between 2008 and 2012. Um, and they as well were randomly assigned artistic activities um, as opposed to general school activities. Um, and these students who completed these art activities and these music activities also had lower cortisol levels. Um, so even in children, it is showing that there is a decreased stress response. Um, and tying into that, um, participating in the arts, specifically music, has been shown to have an increase in um, immune responses. Um, and that potentially has a lot to do with cortisol levels because when cortisol levels are high, um, immune responses typically fall and so you're more likely to fall ill. Um, so if you can reduce cortisol levels, um, you may in fact be in boost, boosting your immune response. So a study conducted by Powell's with Volterani, Marani, and Kostakiewicz um, showed that listening to music may actually increase the activity of those natural killer cells and lymphocytes, um, which would um, theoretically mean that individuals would be less likely to get sick. Um, and as previously mentioned, that's hypothesized to link to the decreased cortisol levels as well. Now, moving to nursing as a self-care tool, um, Dr. Andrea Kowaleski has done a lot of research about the benefits of the arts, kind of as an umbrella term, and how that relates to nurses um, for their self-care. Because nurses, um, I mean, with a lot of professions, there's a lot of stress involved. Um, and so she was specifically looking at ways to combat that stress and hopefully keep individuals who are in the nursing field happier and in the field for longer. Um, and so she studied a variety of arts, I mean pretty much anything from baking, gardening, music, physical art such as you know coloring and dancing, sculpting, I mean she studied um, a subsection of almost everything. And she suggests that participating in an activity that pertains to the arts can affect um, an individual in several different realms. Um, so her dimensions that she studied were cognitive, emotional, physical, social, and spiritual. Um, and all of this comes together under the biopsychosocial bio approach, which is um, displayed over here on the side of the screen. Um, and this was really effective because music affects um, people very differently. Um, and it, she found that it was really hard for individuals to quantify um, how music was affecting them. So someone could say that it improved their cognitive status, but then um, they also felt that it impacted like their social and their physical well-being as well. Um, so using this approach, she was able to kind of lump some of that um, into different realms to make it easier to show um, how individuals felt like they were being affected by this, um, by this intervention here. Um, and there was a specific study done on nursing students in 2015 that I thought was very interesting. Oh, excuse me, yeah, 2015. Um, this was done in Korea on several nursing students. So nursing students in this study um, were involved in a choir um, for one semester of nursing school. Um, and after that, they did a qualitative result, uh, or a qualitative analysis of the results and found that all of the students had um, lower stress levels, they felt like they had an increased ability to manage their schoolwork, and they felt like they had improvement in teamwork and generalized confidence, which as a nurse, that is very, very important to have. You need to have that teamwork and cohesiveness. Um, and this isn't something that's new to the field. I found this picture and thought that it was really cool. Um, student nurses are singing Christmas carols um, to a pediatric patient um, back in the 70s. So it's still very much a part of care, but just showing that um, it may have more benefits than we realize. 
Um, the other benefit that is really lucrative for healthcare professionals is it may have increased productivity. So according to research conducted by Dr. Christine Sinsky, listening to music can actually prove, pr um, excuse me, boost your productivity um, while charting. Um, so this specific study focused on physicians that they have while they're charting. Um, and just to clarify, charting is um, just like the electronic healthcare um, records. So any member of the healthcare, you need to chart all of your um, interventions, you know, anything that you're doing with your patients, you have to have records of that. Um, and so that can be very, very time consuming if you think of how many patients these individuals are working with on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, but this study suggested that physicians who listened to music while they charted had much um, quicker um, or they were much more productive and they could finish their charting much faster. Um, so that translates to more face time with patients if you're not spending so much time on the computer. Um, one thing that was really interesting to us, she suggested that although the specific type of music doesn't necessarily matter um, as far as you can still get some benefit from music therapy, um, the sensitivity to different types of music um, is a little bit variable still. But she suggests me video game music may have an increased sensitivity to improving um, productivity because that music is specifically designed to keep people engaged in um, a specific task. So all of the music like played in certain video games, um, that is designed to keep people playing the game for longer. So theoretically, she thinks if you listen to that while you're charting, it will keep you more engaged in your charting and you'll be able to do it for longer without getting distracted. Um, and then one more study kind of going off of that, there were studies on OR staff, which is operating room, um, and suggest that there's a higher rate of productivity and overall satisfaction when music is played. Um, that is still somewhat debatable depending on the different staffs asked, but overall the majority of these studies um, showed that they enjoyed their work more when music was played. Um, and then seeking that, or going back um, to Dr. Andrea Kowalewski, she talked about improving the overall quality of life. Um, there are a couple more studies done um, that just show that when music is used as an intervention, patients have you know, the decreased stress, the decreased pain levels, and all of that comes to a greater quality of life. People are happier for longer. Um, one specific study showed that patients <coughs> with heart failure had a 4.4 greater chance of survival after five years um, after they participated in this study and listened to music twice a day for 12 minutes. I mean, so for a mere 20 minutes a day, these individuals had lower stress levels and actually showed to have a higher um, chance of still being alive after this diagnosis five years later. Um, another study on stroke patients um, showed that they had um, overall well-being scores had increased from 14 to 18 um, after participating in bi-weekly 45-minute sessions for a mere six weeks. Um, these people had the overall quality of life, but they also had increased mobility and movement. Um, which is huge. So in conclusion, as future nurses, we can still include music in our patient's plan of care without being certified music therapists. Um, because when listening to music is used as a nursing intervention, it has effects that are quantifiable, proving that music does have value in the healthcare system. Any questions? Um. Uh, before I ask the question, I tell you, I've spent a lot, I've spent quite a few, um, quite a lot of energy looking at the placebo effect. And all of your outcomes for music match the effects of a placebo. And what, I, what I'm going to suggest is that music is a trigger for a placebo effect. Placebo effect is known to be influenced by your view of what you're receiving in terms of the cost of the drug. Mm -hmm. It's also um, based on the attention that you are given as a patient. Definitely. Many of these studies are done in Britain where there are different kinds of human trial rules than they are in this country. Mm -hmm. For example, sham surgeries where you have a big emotional involvement are much more efficient in the placebo effect than a sugar pill. So I would encourage you to, to consider that because there are people who are advocating healthcare changes that 
influence everyone in terms of a bigger placebo effect. Mm -hmm. And it's known to be genetic, it's known to influence hormones, it's Anyway. Yeah, that's a very interesting topic, which I have to agree with you. Um, I mean, I think especially when individuals enter the healthcare system, I mean, they're sick, they're stressed. And so if someone can offer them anything that they believe will help them, they're more likely to buy into that as well. So There's actually a, a study from the 1930s that some psychologists did. It's called the Hawthorne Effect. Mm -hmm. And they went in and all they did was put lighting, in a, better lighting in a factory, and productivity went up. When they removed the lighting, the productivity didn't change. It was simply the fact that these people were being talked to and evaluated and being, you know, again, you're mo we're very emotional beings. Definitely. <laughs> yeah, that's very interesting. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So I wonder if there's any way to, to separate out, I mean, you, you're, a lot of the studies you showed, some of them were more like passive listening to music, mm -hmm. whereas others were more active things, like you talked some things about painting and singing, yeah. right? And so it seemed like when you showed more physiological data, like cortisol levels, it was more with the active stuff. Right, um, for some of it, but then some of the cortisol levels were also the children just listening to music. So there was a little bit of both. Right, but do you think there's a difference in terms of the 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 the, the response to more of an active involvement in arts mm -hmm. um, versus more of a passive thing? In my opinion, I mean, and I really have no credentials, <laughs> but I would think that the active participation, someone who is actually making music or singing or creating the arts would possibly have um, a greater effect because there's no, um, they would have to be involved with the activity if that makes more sense. Someone could be listening to music and still be thinking through a lot of things in their head and still be stressing themselves out about the procedure. But if someone were, for instance, someone who was post, you know, preoperatively, um, they were singing and dancing. It's a little bit harder to still, you know, have your mind wander. Um, so I would think that they would have a higher rate of satisfaction or decreased cortisol levels. Other questions? All right. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And the title of his talk is bioinformatics of the C. elegans melatonin signaling pathway. Go ahead, Michael. Hi, my name is Michael, and this is the research that I've done over the past year with Dr. Fields, titled The Bioinformatics of the C. elegans melatonin signaling pathway. So to provide a little background, melatonin is a hormone found across all organisms, from plants to bacteria, invertebrates, invertebrates. With this wide distribution, it is to be expected that it is involved in a range of physiological processes. Some of these we can see on the figure on the left. They include circadian rhythms, blood pressure regulation, immune function, and the focus of Dr. Field's research, which is on neuronal development. However, the problem with studying uh, melatonin's role in neuronal development is that using a vertebrate system is difficult due to the fact that vertebrates have such complex nervous systems. So to get by this, we use a model organism known as Centerabditis elegans, which is a free-living nematode. It's microscopic, and it's commonly used as a, as a uh, model organism in neural development due to its simple nervous system with 302 neurons. There's also a wealth of information available as it was the first multicellular organism to have its genome sequenced. And it is the first and only organism to have its connectome or neuronal wiring diagram fully constructed. So we know all the neuronal connections. So what do we know about uh, C. elegans and melatonin? Uh, C. elegans takes up melatonin in its diet and there's also some evidence of melatonin synthesis enzymes. So it can in fact synthesize melatonin. And then there was a study in 2007 where they used melatonin receptor antagonists. So they, they found that MTR1 signaling regulates locomotion behavior. However, these researchers were unable to identify any melatonin receptors. So this is where my research comes in. Uh, the goal was to use a bioinformatics approach to narrow down potential melatonin receptor candidates and to also look at the synthesis and signaling pathway a little bit further. So this would involve a stepwise approach beginning with BLAST, or basic local alignment search tool, which is a sequence searching tool where you could basically, for example, put in human uh, melatonin receptor sequences, 
and look across the database and find sequences that were similar to C. elegans. Once we had candidates, we would do multiple sequence alignments and transmembrane predictions to see if there's any similarity or identity in specific transmembrane domains. Then phylogenetic analysis to look at uh, how our candidates line up phylogenetically and molecular modeling to vis visualize our candidates structurally. And then shifting gears, we would look at protein-protein interaction of our G proteins that have been already determined. And we would also try to tie this all together with promoter and transcription factor prediction of our synthesis enzymes and our candidate melatonin receptors. So we began with the blast search of human melatonin receptors against C. elegans. Uh, e value was what we used for that significance. So the lower the E value, the more significant the hit. So we put the top 15 up here. Uh, if you can, can kind of tell, it doesn't weed out the results very well, and that's not a very significant E value. This is likely due to the number of GPCRs in C. elegans coupled with the evolutionary distance between humans and C. elegans. We took this a step further just to look at it a little deeper and used three of these candidates, NPR35, NPR6, and NPR10. And we did multiple sequence alignments with those. We showed a greater similarity to MTR2. And then NPR35 was the most similar candidate that we found. However, not, we weren't very happy with these results, so we wanted to take a different approach. So we searched the entire NCBI protein database for all melatonin receptor sequences. And luckily, we found three parasitic nematodes. I uh, should note that these are predicted uh, melatonin receptors, but due to their limited genome and limited number of GPCRs, it is likely to suggest that they are melatonin receptors. We blasted each of those, and they came up with a top hit of an uncharacterized protein in C. elegans, F59D12. The multiple sequence alignment of that can be seen at the bottom. Those asterisks are showing the identity, so there's a lot of identity between these sequences. There isn't a lot of information available on F59, but one study used RNA interference and, and knocked out locomotion. And this would be the phenotype we would expect from a mutant C. elegans melatonin receptor. Moving a little bit further, we did pairwise alignments to try to look at just overall protein sequence. Uh, as you can see on the right, the E value drops off significantly from the parasitic nematodes to the vertebrates, suggesting minimal overall protein conservation sequence. But when we looked at multiple sequence alignments, they did show identity and similarity in transmembrane domains, but not necessarily in the overall sequence. <clears throat> For the phylogenetic analysis, kind of backed up what we were already seeing that our candidates were clustering with the parasitic nematodes and also a segmented worm, but weren't clustering at all with the vertebrates. And then just structurally, F59 is on the right and on the left is F59, structurally aligned with the human melatonin receptor. We did this with all our candidates, and F59 showed the most structural similarity. So now that we had a good candidate, we kind of wanted to look at uh, the synthesis pathway a little bit further. And we found through the literature that TPH1 and BAS1 respectively result in the production of serotonin. This is well characterized in C. elegans. Then ANAT1 and HOMT1 are the two enzymes that result what we think now in the production of melatonin. They are not as well characterized. We took each of these and just did sequence similarity as well. TPH1 and BAS1 show high identity to the human enzymes and rather vertebrate enzymes. But the same cannot be said for ANAT1 and HOMT1. They show very little to no similarity with uh, vertebrate enzymes. This is likely to suggest that there may be multiple enzymes capable of synthesizing melatonin in C. elegans. We also had some G proteins from the 2007 study that they found, Agle 30 and GPA7. These correspond just to G alpha subunits respectively. But we wanted to do protein-protein interaction analysis of these, so we looked on a database uh, for determined and predicted interactions. Uh, they interacted kind of with what you would expect, a GPCR signaling pathway. Uh, 
GTP ACES, MAP kinase pathway, fossil IPC. Uh, most importantly from these results was each of these signalers interacted with neuronal downstream signalers. So they are it's signaling a neuronal pathway, which is what we're looking for. Lastly, we tried to try to tie this all together with promoter and transcription factor prediction. So we took the synthesis enzymes in our candidates and tried to find similar promoter regions and transcription factors. However, we came ran into some limitations with uh, tools for identifying uh, promoter sequences and C. elegans aren't well equipped for C. elegans promoters at this time. And there's also limited promoters determined and the same can be said for transcription factors as well. So we couldn't find a lot of definitive results from this at this point based on the software. So to kind of conclude what we're doing currently, we're doing RNA interference on those three NPR proteins that we first determined, NPR6, NPR10, and NPR35. We have F59 mutants that we are outcrossing for, for behavioral study to better characterize the phenotype. And also in the future, we'll do a GFP fusion on the promoter region of F59 to determine expression location because we don't have those expression location readily available. But ultimately, we were able to come up with a pretty good candidate for a C. elegans melatonin receptor and also have a better idea of the synthesis and signaling pathway to better utilize this model organism for neuronal development study. I'd just like to thank Dr. Fields for his mentoring and helping with the honors thesis and all this research. I'd also like to thank the biology department, honors college, K and Brian and ESERP for just funding and providing an opportunity to do this research. And I'll take any questions. So most of this work was set up by the observation that melatonin receptor antagonists affected locomotion in C. elegans. Mm -hmm. right, so do, do you know much about those, ag those, those, those receptor uh, antagonists? Are they, are they very, very specific for melatonin receptor? Or is it possible that they're interacting with other things that are affecting locomotion? I don't know a lot, but I know that they use them in vertebrate mod, vertebrate systems more than in vertebrate systems. So they are pretty specific to vertebrates, but as you've shown, I don't know how well that correlates over it. Well, and that's kind of where I was going with this, because yeah. then, then later you showed that what you identified wasn't all that similar to vertebrate. Yeah, overall. Right? So now I'm trying to understand how the antagonist would affect a receptor that's very, very different than what it was designed for. Yeah, I don't know exactly where that antagonist is binding. I kind of have to know that to have a better idea because there is some similarity in transmembrane domains, but that overall sequence, I'm not really sure where that. Yeah, the, the, the critical part is what's yeah. binding melatonin. Right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, and that we don't really well know even in vertebrates. In the synthesis of melatonin, the, the last two enzymes you, you stated were, did not have a lot of homology to the yeah. vertebrate. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Would that imply that it may be a different, a different mechanism to get to melatonin? I mean, we know that enzymes can have major activity with one particular substrate and minor activity with another substrate. In fact, uh, the minor activity can be unrelated to the chemistry of the primary substrate, which I find very interesting because it could say that that an enzyme um, can be a helper when there's a deficit of the major enzyme. And, and again, the fact that the, the two enzymes in the synthesis of melatonin are different strikes me as kind of an oddity, I guess. Yeah, I don't know if they're just kind of helping to synthesize it and it's not necessarily their main job because they it kind of, they kind of showed in one of the studies that this whole family might be able to get to the, the next step of that. And then the same could be said for that other HOMT1, that family of enzymes is converting into that. So I don't know if it's too specific, but somehow that's able to synthesize in the melatonin. Also, I noticed uh, that you had stated the previous studies on the uh, F59 D12, they used RNA interference, and you, you had a line that said it knocked out locomotion. What, is that, what did that actually mean? 
Uh, Due to slow commotion or? They were paralyzed and they couldn't. They were paralyzed? Yeah. Because our F-59 D-12 mutant mm -hmm. seems to move normally. Yeah, some fairly normally, yeah. So I'd, I'd be sort of curious about uh, looking at that previous study using mm -hmm. RNAi to... Yeah, they looked at 60 GPCRs, so I don't know how specific, you probably have to, I don't know how specific for F-59 they were in their research, but... Okay. Any other questions for Michael? All right, thank you. It's uh, Mariah Ray, and the title of her talk is Insertion, Insertion Sequence Target Specific Locations in Halobacterium Salinarium NRC1. <coughs> As Dr. Burnett said, my name is Mariah Ray, and I will be talking today about the insertion sequences and how they target Halobacterium. So to start off, I'd like to thank Dr. Burnett um, for being a mentor on this project, as well as the KAB program for funding, for funding the project, and Brianna Brooks and Jolene Hunt for a couple of their data points and pictures. So to start off, what are insertion sequences? So to explain this, I have a little animation for you. So insertion sequences are pieces of DNA that will excise out of their current position through a transposase enzyme and relocate to another position in the genome through a cut and paste method. You can see here, it's finally out of the place. This sequence is an inverted repeat or a palindrome sequence. And so it will insert right here. You can see, taking this whole time. And then paste in, and then a DNA's, uh, not DNA, excuse me, uh, polymerase will add in uh, nucleotides accordingly. So you'll have this sequence right here is the general structure of it. So as you can see in the middle, the only gene that these insertion sequences code for is the enzyme to excise itself out and cut and paste itself back in somewhere else. And then the others are the inverted repeats as well. And so these sequences are found in almost every um, species that you can think of. So they were first characterized um, in, as jumping genes in Barbara Lepentox, uh, maize, or corn. And um, their sequence in bacteria is just the simple ones. There's a lot more compl complex uh, mechanisms in humans and vertebrates as well. So the organism I'm studying is an archaean. So it's a little bit different for bacteria. It has a little bit different genome structure. Um, it is salt-loving or halophilic. So if you put these guys in water, they automatically lyse just because it's too um, concentrated of a solution. And then they also form gas vesicles. So the insertion sequences in the halobacterium, they're about 500 to 600 base pairs in length. They are 91 of them characterized in the specific species, and they're very active. This is very unusual in um, any species. Usually these are very dormant. They're stuck in one place, and then random, occasionally they move through generations. Um, and so you can track evolutionary changes from these. But in this specific sequence, they move rapidly. Uh, and they also use the cut and paste method of insertion. And so the gas vesicles I mentioned earlier, we look at these not because the function originally is to provide buoyancy for these ox to get to oxygen rich regions in their natural environment. Um, but we use them because they produce this pinkish cloudy phenotype. So a mutated version of this will turn red and translucent as you see here, it makes them really, really easy for extraction. And so what I did with this is I extracted these. Uh, first, here's a little bit about the gene. Um, it's unique in that it's a gene cluster. So there's four genes on one strand and then 10 on the other strand. Uh, and so we looked at this entire genome sequence. It's about 9,000 base pairs long. And we are examining the question, do insertion sequences insert randomly within this GBP? So our experimental design, again, we excise the, or we extract the red mutants. We culture them, incubate them for about four days at 42 degrees Celsius, uh, spread them on dilution plates, and then incubate them again at 42 degrees Celsius to get a plate like this. And so on there, you can't see them right now. You can only see the pink colonies. The red ones are actually kind of, they're not hard to find under a microscope. They're just hard to see with the naked eye. 
And so if I excise those, I amplify the genes based on a specific primer set, as you can see here indicated by the arrows. We have six of them just because this is a rather large gene, and, or gene cluster, I should say. And then we put those on a gel. So what this does is positively identifies which primer set the insertion has jumped into. And so this one, I believe it's my AC primer. As you can see, the different increases in G, uh, base pair length show an insertion sequence is present. And so compared to the wild type, it's about 200 to 500 base, or 500 to 1600 base pairs in length of an increase. And so we know there's an insertion sequence there. We just don't know the type of it. So after this, I send them all for sequencing and I get this histogram back. So from this, I can blast it against the uh, genome, the entire genome, or just the GDP cluster specifically, and then determine where the location is that doesn't match the wild type. So that indicates that there is an insertion, at that point, there's an insertion sequence. And I take that insertion sequence, I go back to this histogram, I take the entire insertion sequence, the one that doesn't match the wild type DNA, and I, if, again, kind of blast it against an IS binder. So this database shows the entire uh, known ISs that have been determined. And from that website, I can determine the type of IS and then how long it is and uh, different characteristics of that have been characterized previously. So in summary, from this research, I collected 246 mutants. I sequenced 150 samples. And then I got back 101 locations and IS identified. So again, do these insertion sequences insert random? From this, you can see the two most common types are the ISH2 and ISHAB. So you can see those in the black and red spots, or the black and white spots. Um, there's also the uh, just other generalized IS. There's different names for them, but there is too many to count, or not too many to count, but too many to put on the slide. Um, and so there's kind of an odd distribution. There's a lot in this AC region, uh, and not as much in the NO and the KLM. And so more specifically, I want to point out to your attention these five points right here. So these five points are where two insertion sequences insert in the exact same location from different cultures. So this is really interesting because if they were random, this wouldn't happen. You would not see out of a 9,000 base pair um, genome, the gene cluster, you wouldn't see this um, occurring just because the chances are very low. So, Back to the distribution. Um, I separated the gene into about 20 equal, 25 equal 20% um, as seen here, just based on base pair length. And through an even distribution out of 101 base pairs, you should see about 16 insertion sequences in each of those sections. So from here, you can see in the fourth section, which is the AC region, um, very close to it, there's 37, so almost double that, or actually more than double. And then the fifth and tenth region, or first regions, there's a lot, lot less. And so just the in distribution of it is not uh, random at all. It's quite selective. And so the insertion is not random. Uh, you can see uh, the probability of randomness, the likelihood, going back to those five points, the likelihood of one of those happening is 1.25 time, 1 times 10 to the negative sixth percent of occurring randomly. And then multiply that by or, yeah, multiply that by five, and it's six point two five times to the negative ten percent, negative six percent. So as you can see from those um, just basic statistics, this uh, occurrence is not random. And so exploring possible mechanisms of this. So we've shown that it's not random. How is it doing this? Uh, we looked at a consensus sequence. That was my first um, idea. Is there must be something that just sequences are aligning, that's where it's jumping into. Well, I did a comparison of kin sequences, um, the first 100 base pairs uh, before each insertion, and there wasn't any consensus. And so that led me to believe maybe it's methylation. There's a methylation, um, that, that's where it's jumping into. That was too expensive to explore at this time. <laughs> and so we moved on to the confirmation of DNA. If the DNA is actively being more transcribed um, and replicated, is it are the insertion sequences more likely to jump in then? Um, and so for these preliminary results, it's a much more promising hypothesis. I didn't have any um, actual results to show you today. 
but there is a trend that as the DNA confirmation is being um, more transcribed, that the insertion, I'm finding more insertion sequences in that specific one through a mutation frequency count. With that, is there any other questions? Questions for Mariah? Yes. Uh, do you, if you isolate a mutant, do you actually get uh, revertence? Then, if you sort of propagate those, do you see the dark red ones going back to pink in some in some cases? I believe they jump uh, back out. I specifically didn't study that, but a previous class um, did. I do believe the results they do sometimes. It's not. Um, I didn't think they found any significant difference. I don't think they ever found one to go back. Oh no. Yeah, they. If we culture, we take a mutant culture and watch it, you know, over a month or so and keep plugging it out, they just stay red. So, yeah, we haven't. So, just seen real stability. It. Or it moves out, but it doesn't repair. Because it leaves it behind. Uh, once uh, it's there, it completely destroys the gene. Even if it moves, it leaves behind those and yeah, the repeats and screws right. up the gene. Right. And differentiating between those two is really tough because you have sure. a sequence <laughs> a thousand different. <laughs> So you had about a hundred mutants that you collected that you did not sequence. Yes. Explain that. So the early, uh, the early process, it could have just been my technical error, uh, messing up on a gel. I didn't um, load it right, read it right, so I couldn't positively identify that there was a sequence there. Um, as I got more skilled with the technique. Um, it could be a possibility of um, us not, there's a different reason for it, I guess. Or the, the insertion sequence, um, our primers also don't cover the full length. So there could be a sequence in the middle that we're just not catching as well that I couldn't positively identify. Because uh, there are some also that I sequenced, but I couldn't find any insertion. So the entire genome matched the wild type as well. And this was originally the gene for the uh, gas vesicles, is that correct? Yes, those 14 okay. genes. So the gas vesicles. vesicles, if they're produced to get the oxygen and you're growing them under oxygen conditions, I guess the reverse experiment, what happens when you grow them in the absence of oxygen? I don't think the gas vesicles would form just by, not mutation, um, just lack of function. Because well, there's no, other I, mechanisms of yes, but if they're growing anaerobically or under reduced oxygen conditions, and they're not making the gas vesicles, you may not see the insertions then because it's yeah, not yeah. actively yeah, so, okay. yeah. So we're on the same frequency. Then. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, Sorry. Yeah, those mu the mutations we're specifically looking at is a mutation in the GBP protein. So there is 91 of these mm -hmm. somewhere in the genome at all times. Um, it's just a matter of fact if they happen to jump into that gene for that cluster um, when I'm looking at them when they're plated on that colony. So, so is there a difference in transposase genes? The, 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 what, what, you've got a whole bunch of insertion sequence classes. Have you looked at uh, the structure of the transposase genes that those actually encode and, and whether that will actually influence then the, the specificity of, of the insertion site. I have not, but that's a really interesting point to bring up and that would be a good future study. Um, because yeah, there are some base pairs that are um, 500 in length, the 16 in length, they're obviously different. It's not just all inverted repeats in those differences. So there must be different transposase genes there. That would be interesting. I already have the DNA, so I can just see that. Cool. But you looked at the, at the possibility that even, could you, as separate families, at least for mm -hmm. ISH2 and ISH8, those are the two that you found most commonly, yeah. and there wasn't any sequence similarity in terms of the places where they were found. No, there wasn't any, cons yeah, there wasn't any consensus sequence um, similarities um, in those two, but I only found 38 and 28 of those, so it's not, and it would be interesting to know how the transposase differs between at least those two, since those are the two you have the most data on. Yeah. Anything else? All right. Thanks, Mariah.